behind me and I turned around and it was Archangel Michael. Mm -hmm. And he put a hand on each shoulder and looked at me in the eye and said, you belong to us now. I'm like, what does that mean? He says, you are a spiritual paramedic and you need to go back. So how do you argue with an archangel? <laughs> and I have to caveat, throw the caveat out there that when you're over there, words are not used. It's all emotional, energetic exchange. And so the challenge for indie ears is called ineffability or the inability to explain. And so I'm trying to use English language to explain that energetic exchange. And the only words I can come up with that get close to that is spiritual paramedic. And how I move through the world now with that title. Um, paramedic is someone who basically scrapes you up, patches you up, and then sends you on to the next level where you can get a higher level of care. They're the ones that meet you at the point of trauma and then get you someplace where you can get a, a better level of care. So having been a nurse, um, having done CPR, uh, having uh, caught people uh, in the process of dying and being blessed enough to bring them back, paramedic resonated with me. But because of all of the things I've had happen to me in the metaphysical realm, I think that's why I have been gifted with all of these different experiences so that no matter who I meet in the road of life, um, when I meet them at that point of trauma, that I can reach back and say, okay, I, I understand you. I, I not only sympathize, but I can empathize. I've been there. I am the wounded healer. So let me come to where you are, scrape you up, patch you up, and hand you off to the person who is better qualified and better suited to take care of you. And for a while, I called myself air traffic control because people just kind of come through your life and move on. But while you have them in your influence, you try to direct them. But spiritual paramedic played back in my head a few times to the point of, okay, maybe this is what I need to start calling myself. And once I started doing that, that whisper or that nudge stopped. So I'm like, okay, I guess that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I went through that imposter syndrome that a lot of people go through of, you know, I'm just a dude driving a meat suit. Well, how dare I call myself a spiritual paramedic? I mean, that's kind of elevating yourself. And it's why I don't call myself a Reiki master. I call myself a Reiki three because master means, oh, you must know everything. And we've already established that. I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> I want to leave space to learn more. So yeah, that's where I came up with spiritual paramedic. It's well, I mean, yeah, it was given to you. I think, yeah, you don't argue with the archangel. It's like, okay, okay. Note taken. Um, but also it's so, again, this theme of not understanding who we are and wanting to play ourselves down because we don't want to be too big. Well, that's how we don't get found is by not being too big. And if you want to be lost, make sure you stay small. Um, and so I'm six, five, I can't be small. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now we're going to work on the rest of it anyway, but like, yeah, I, I'll say, um, John showed up our first chat. I won't go into all the details because that's for another podcast. But I was in an extremely horrible, no good, rotten, very bad state. And John was there on, on that day. And it, you know, it was unintentional. And he literally, what he just said is exactly what I experienced, where he was able to put me back together enough to let me be functional to go on to the next moment. And so witness, testify, it is real. Um, <laughs> All right. Now, before we go into your NDE story, <laughs> and I, I want to apologize to everybody on YouTube because I didn't realize YouTube does this thing when I hit live, it shows me that it's going, but then it's like, oh, but we're not really live. So I apologize that we didn't, you didn't get the full thing. It will be on our podcast. Clink down, clink, clink down the below um, on one of our podcast links. And I will put the whole show there. So if you are like, ah, oh, I missed the beginning, it'll be there for you. Okay. So Apologies. I'm going to pray for YouTube and not against it. Um, all right. So 
John, I want to know your experiences about, um, because as a kid, you had metaphysical experiences even before having the NDE. So let's hear about your experience with your grandpa. Yeah, the, the so the, the circus uh, started at nine years old and I didn't have my uh, NDE until I was like 38, 39. So there was that whole gap of like what I consider the foundations were being set. So when when I was a child, my grandfather was my babysitter slash caregiver and he was first generation German American. So mm. I grew up speaking German and English and hanging out with grandpa. Uh, so I had kind of like that immigrant type of influence uh, growing up, uh, if you know what that means. Uh, and when he passed away, it made me angry. And so, you know, here I am at nine years old and, you know, going to bed one night and mom's like, did you wash your face? Did you brush your teeth? Did you say your prayers? And when we got to say your prayers, I said, no. And they're like, well, why not? I'm not praying anymore. Well, when you're, when your Baptist father and your Catholic mother say, yeah, I'm not praying anymore. It's like, <laughs> lose on the parenting. <laughs> and so they're like, why, why, what's going on? And I said, God took away grandpa. So the only thing I know to do is to take something away from God. Uh, and that's my Scorpio nature, <laughs> sting. <laughs> So um, there was an intervention. Uh, Dad's intervention was, uh, you better pray or I'm going to whip your ass. And mom's intervention was to invite the priest over for dinner, uh, unbeknownst to me, and then explain uh, why God is so great and awesome and why I'm an asshat and I should just be appreciative to have God's love and not to turn that away. Uh, so neither one of those worked. <laughs> so one, one night... Um, in my dream state, I woke up and sitting at the foot of my bed was grandpa. And I'm like, what, what are you doing here? And he pat me on the leg and said, I'm in such a much better place now and I don't hurt anymore. Uh, he had cancer of the esophagus that ran all the way down to his stomach. And he went from being six foot, maybe 200 to about 90 pounds when he finally passed. And I was there. So I was doing, I was assisting with tube feedings. I was assisting with bandage changes. I was intimately involved with his um, final chapter. So for him to show up, it was a gift. It was epiphany. And <laughs> he said, now I want you to start praying to God again. Don't be mad at him. And because I'm no longer in that body, I can now watch out for you for the rest of your life. So think of me as your extra guardian angel. Nice. Okay. So dear. So he gave me a hug. And what's really amazing is that in that hug or in that embrace, I can still smell the old spice slash tobacco smell that was grandpa i can still feel his maroon wool sweater against my cheek as i was crying and that that wet wool type of feel so it was a very visceral type of experience that wasn't a dream and so when i got up the next morning i'm happy as a clam and be bopping around and my parents are like well that was a changed you know oh are you praying again <laughs> like no i saw grandpa's ghost and we talked last night and uh death is 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 fake it's not real <laughs> of course uh that didn't go over well also with my parochial parents uh, so what evolved was a couple more of those events of me either contacting deceased relatives or relatives who had become deceased knew that I could be a conduit. And so they'd come see me. And in the course of a year, three family members passed. Three messages came. And three times I was told by my parents, don't you dare talk about this stuff. So I didn't. Wow. But that's where it all started. Wow. Sorry, I was slow to unmute there. Um, 
Yeah, and I think I think you're right. This was kind of like an early initiation. But what a transformative thing to have somebody show up who said, don't grieve for me. I'm your guardian angel now. I'm always with you. I mean, that's a perception change for forever. Um, let, let's talk about, I want to get to, just because it's a good story, even though it's gross, I want to get to the pervy ghost, the gross ghost, as I like to uh, refer to it, the gross ghost story. Um, are there any other stories that lead up to that? Because this is all before your NDE. Well, so I, that was about nine years old. And so from like nine to 10 was, you know, relatives popping in and giving me the message. And then I would give it to mom and dad and they're like, no, <laughs> it's like, okay. And so I think what happened is that it was either determined we need to change how we're giving John messages or we realized that that conduit for John is not going to work. So we on the other side need to find other conduits. And I think that's why my teenage and twenties were like whack-a-mole, a a metaphysical whack-a-mole, because if one wouldn't work, then they'd find something else that would work. So from nine and 10 was spirit communication. At 14, uh, I was out riding my bike and there was a garage sale and I bought a box of books for three bucks. And in there was uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, Theory of Psychoanalysis, the first edition in English, Um, um, Maslow's Hierarchy. There was also um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And there was also Far Journeys by Robert Monroe. And so that one really interested me because it was like, you mean I can go places and I don't need to take my body? That's weird, but it read so matter of fact that it was almost like an instruction manual. And so I didn't question it, but I also knew I couldn't tell my parents about it because, you know, I, you know, sent to dinner and, or sent to my room without dinner. Uh, So I read it like an instruction manual and like a typical guy, uh, I didn't read all the instructions. I got like halfway through the book and I just said, okay, let's grip it and rip it and see what happens. Uh, and so I was going to grandma's house. I was going to my cousin's house. And so the remote viewing then kind of turned on or actually the out of body experience turned on. And the reason why I course corrected there was that out of body is a more broad term. And then in that out of body state, you can astral project, which is just you being the driver, or you can do remote viewing, which means you have a handler who is helping you to drive. Um, And it's really good if you're starting to have that out-of-body experience to have that remote viewer that can give you that veracity. Uh, So I was doing both of those. Um, And then I was at a party at 19 where someone was doing tarot. And so I was just amused by the colors and the artwork of the Rider Waite deck. And so I took the cards with the person's permission and started playing with them. And then I did a reading on the person who was doing the readings. And so she had to interpret it. I had no idea what I was doing. I just like, this is my intention. I dealt out the cards and I said, okay, what does this say? She got halfway through the reading. She stopped and she goes, you did this reading on me, didn't you? Yeah. She said, well, so this card here says I'm pregnant and I am. And I haven't told my husband because it's not his. Oh gosh. So the lesson here is don't do a tarot card reading on someone unless you have permission, because you'll find out things that you shouldn't know. And so you need to ask permission. Okay. Lesson learned. And so I've been doing tarot card readings ever since off and on for families and friends, but I always had the same thing with Reiki. Do I have your permission? And then go from there. Uh, and then I worked in a haunted house which is where this ghost story comes from. And this was in my mid twenties and I just got bombarded. Um, So I worked at a Catholic college and the Catholic college was part of the grounds was actually three mansions that belonged to multimillionaires during the depression. And these were Stokely of Stokely Van Camp pork and beans. This was Allison of Allison Transmissions uh, and Fisher, um, and I can't remember the other one. But these gentlemen created a test ground 
for this new invention called the automobile. And so one was doing transmissions, one was doing headlights, one was um, doing something else. And then they worked with uh, their PR person, Eddie Rickenbacker, who was the World War I fighter ace. They worked and created what is now the Indianapolis Motor or Indianapolis 500. So roll back in time to the 19 teens to mid 1920s, they built these mansions and that's where they set up shop in Indianapolis. And so these multimillionaires had all this property, which later the nuns would buy and make a college. But there were deaths in interesting circumstances in each one of those mansions. And I go in not knowing a damn thing about any of these places. I mean, it was just an old building and I liked the architecture. So I was fascinated by that aspect of it. But when I was there alone, like I was security sometimes and I have to open up or lock up. And later on, when I learned enough about the places I became the docent for, so I'd give tours, like when college kids would come through. Um, I got, I mean, assaulted is too strong of a word, but they, they would, they pestered me. They wouldn't leave me alone. They'd hide my keys. I'd go into a room and turn off a light. I'd come back and the lights on or vice versa. Uh, I had a, um, there was a party and there was a balloon up on the third floor, a helium balloon. I'm like, oh great, I've got to go all the way down to the basement and get a stick and tape a fork to it to stab it and you know bring it back down. So as I'm cleaning and closing up and whatever, I finally get down to the basement and there was a meat locker that they used to store stuff, cleaning stuff. I go into the meat locker and there's the damn balloon. It's like, how did a helium balloon get from the third floor down four floors through the opposite side of the building and into a room that is a meat locker with that big, heavy kerchunk handle? That so, was definitely a message. Definitely like, see us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay, those of us who watch scary movies, it just flew into my head with a scary clown. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. so I watch I watch shows like uh, um, I don't watch them now, but earlier on, I was watching shows like that, and I didn't like how I felt afterward, and I didn't understand why I didn't feel well after that. Then I realized that the energy that goes into that gets poured through the TV, and then you end up with it, and then how you, if you're not good at transmuting that yeah. energy then it just sets up shop through through that's why well, I by the that. time i was in my 20s i had already participated in an exorcism i was already using reiki, reiki to push things out that needed to leave and i was also working with a team of spiritualists by inviting spirits in hearing what they had to say so that we could then cross them over and be with family and again this is all before my near-death experience so the shows now when they come on, I don't even watch them. And shows like The Conjuring or things that actually have to do with um, spirit possession, same thing. I, I won't even watch them because I, I don't want that energy. I've worked hard to disassociate from that energy and to encapsulate that energy and either send it to ground or send it up. Um, so, you know, why, why engage with that if you don't have to? 100%. Yeah. It's always, I'll watch some scary, not scary shows. I'll watch cause I don't like scary shows, but I'll watch, watch like, um, dead files. And even with that, I'm like energetically. Hey, Steve Dushabi. Hey, hey I'm Steve, not too shabby. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, uh, I'll, I'll during that show, I'll be like cleanse cleanse. Cause I'm fascinated and it's educational in a way. I don't agree with all of her you know, like do eight, do these 1800 things in order to get rid of the ghost versus a quantum healing on the house. But like, I, I still find it fascinating, but I'm cleansing the entire time. Like I'm not, you know, like I'm not going to accept this energy. Um, but all right. So get us to the piece where the, the pervy ghost, where you meet the gross ghost. Cause that's the. So the building that they used on the campus was the music building. And at the time I was uh, a music scholarship holder. So I spent a lot of time there. And because I spent a lot of time there, it was like, hey, do you want to make some extra money by being the janitor and closing up shop? Yes, please. Uh, so spent a lot of time there also by myself. 
and that's when peculiar things were happening, you know, lights off that were on and vice versa. And I was at this point, I, again, my exposure to spirits was mostly family. And so I didn't perceive a threat, but I would start getting that cold chill. And then I start get this feeling internally, like if you tip back in a chair and all of a sudden you go too far and you get that <gasps> kind of sensation, I would get that sensation when I would know something is around. And that was my internal, you know, alert. But again, it's like once I had that alert, there wasn't really anything scary up to that point. And so I didn't have a frame of reference. So I'm in the building and I'm closing up, turning off all the lights. I'm about to walk out the door and these headlights come up the drive and there's a horseshoe drive in front of this mansion. And so I'm standing in the foyer trying to figure out who is driving at 10 o'clock at night on, on the drive. And as the headlights kind of sweep through the foyer and into the um, uh, reception area, there is a guy that looks like Teddy Roosevelt. He's in a wool suit, uh, three-piece suit. Uh, the vest has a gold chain that I could see glint uh, as the lights went by. And uh, kind of a robust, uh, a hale uh, individual who had no head. And I'm like, I'm out of here. I come to find out later that, so Stokely, the original builder of this house, um, I saw pictures of him later, and that's who I saw was this Teddy Roosevelt-looking character. He had made his millions. He then lost his millions. He made most of it, but not all of it back um, for reasons that are just speculated upon. He still committed suicide, and his method of suicide was to stick a shotgun in his mouth and blow his head off. So I was like, okay, well, I'm seeing this now. This is interesting. Uh, and so again, I had this the shock of like, oh my God, I saw this. But then when I replayed it in my mind, it was like, this is just somebody saying, I'm here. There was no threat. There was no uh, intimidation. It was just appearance. I'm like, okay, well, maybe he's got something to say. And maybe if I hear it, then he'll go away and whatever. No. When I engaged with him, then he engaged with me. And so there was more obvious things. So it got to the point where there would still be people in the building and it would still be daylight and he'd be coming around. One of the things that happened was, it, so in each one of these rooms, and again, this is like 19 teens to early 1920s when this house was constructed. One of the things they did is they had a push button next to the light switch. And you've seen those old light switches, which is the big black buttons and they toggle back and forth. And they had like mother of pearl inlay in the middle because, you know, millionaire's house. But he had a button next to that. So if you wanted to call a servant, you hit this button and then a, a trigger would happen in the wait staff slash kitchen area. And this arrow would kick and it would have the name of the room. And so if you're back there, you know, making dinner or whatever, and this arrow would kick and you hear a bell ring, oh, Mr. Stokely needs something in this room. And so you toddle off to, to address that. Those bells started going off. And I'd so I would be in the room doing something, sweeping, cleaning, dusting, whatever. And then the bell would go off. I'm like, what the shit? And so I'd go down to see if one of my friends was like messing with me because you're on a college campus in a haunted house and you've got douchebag friends. They're going to mess with you. And they did. So I was fine with that because I messed with them. But I go down there. The room was locked. So no one could have gotten in. But when I go into this locked room, sure enough, the arrow had kicked for the room I was just in. So I started getting cheeky. Uh, I know, Scorpio cheeky, hard to imagine. Uh, but I started challenging him. I'm like, why are you messing with me, dude? I'm taking care of this place. I run people out. Uh, if they're sitting drinks down when they shouldn't have them, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the place clean. I, I am the curator of your home. So give me some slack, dude. Um, somewhere along that pathway, I decided let's mix our metaphors. Um, let's astral project 
into the house and see what I see. And this is before I knew that when you ask project, not only you have to set an X, Y, Z coordinate, but you also need to set a time frame. Because if you don't set a time frame, it'll shoot you back, you know, whenever, 200 years ago or 500 years in the future. So I just said, okay, let's remote view and see what happens. And so I remote viewed and I ended up in the house about 1927, 28. And it's bright, and I'm asleep. It's nighttime when I'm doing this. But when I get to the house, it's bright, it's sunny, the sun's out. Um, all these like Persian rugs were on the floor. Uh, he had barrister cabinets with all these leather bound tomes. And of course, this wavy glass front. I mean, it was masculine, but it was also opulent. You, you knew that there was some cash involved. Um, but as I'm walking around and taking on, oh, wow, this is what this place looked like. And, oh, this piece of furniture was here. And, man, I can't wait to get back and, and, and ask people to get veracity on this. And I turn a corner, and there's the guy with his head, thankfully. But he thanks me. He says, I'm so glad we could finally meet. He says, I, I want to express to you how happy I am that you are taking care of this place. And I've been trying to communicate with you. But I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I'm, I'm glad you found this way so we can talk. I'm like, oh, cool. This is great. So, yeah, wow. let's talk. And so we started at the top of the of the, the mansion. And he walked me through. And it's like, so this is the cold storage. And this is where, you know, we store the winter clothes during the summer. And uh, there was something that was really interesting there. There was probably a uh, six foot by six foot cube. But when you open it up, it was lined with light bulbs. I'm like, what is this? He goes, well, this is what we would use for a sauna back in the day. Oh, okay. Because electricity was the new thing. And so anytime you can add electricity to something, it was like, oh, there's a health benefit. Uh, so just things like that, when I came back to reality, I could confirm with others and they were like, oh yeah, there was that. Or wow, there's this picture from 80 years ago that yeah, it does demonstrate that. So little triggers like that. I saw, I found a hidden safe. Uh, I found uh, ductwork that was hidden. Um, I found um, a, a panel in the house. If you push the panel, you could slide it aside, and there was a place where you can hide documents. So these little things that the nuns knew because they'd had it for 60, 50 some years, but you don't tell the students because they'll abuse that. So I got my veracity, and so I kept going back and he would tell me more stuff well one time i went back he's like oh i got to show you this i'm like yeah let's go and i've completely got my defenses down and we go down into the basement and i i mean geez how many horror movies have we seen don't follow the scary guy into the basement you know and of course i go and it's no big deal and again i got the guy mind going on he's like so this is where we pump in the water from the cold springs and then we run it through the ice house to create colder water but then it gets distributed through a separate radiator system and that's how we have air conditioning in the house because we have box fans behind this cold radiator and it cools the place down by about 10 15 degrees and i'm like oh yeah this is cool this is amazing so he's getting me further and further he gets me to the all the way to the furthest point the darkest point in the basement and there's a room and it's a concrete room it's probably 10 by 10. it's got this big oak solid door with a big kerchunk handle on it and i'm like oh this must be your cold storage he goes that's exactly correct you're so smart and he opens up the door and we go inside and of course you know so there's onions and potatoes and rutabagas and uh there's some um uh, cured meat hanging from hooks and i'm like oh okay I, I i get this whatever we turn a corner and in the corner is probably a four or five year old boy naked dirty emaciated i'm like what the hell is this and i turned to look at him and his whole face had changed it had gotten gray and creased his eyes were no longer eyes they were just black um, his teeth were now metal and shiny and again the energy not the words the energy happened of he was trying to get into my body 
because he wanted to use my astral body to sodomize that little boy with the intention of then being able to possess me at will and continue doing that perversion in modern day. And so I was going to be his, his proxy or his avatar for his debauchedness. And that just, I mean, there was multiple shocks to the system. Oh my God, you're trying to possess me. Oh my God, you're not who I thought you were. You want me to do what to this little boy? And in all of these shocks, um, I started to feel myself slipping away. And all of a sudden there was this divine rage. And I know that's a kind of a counterpoint to, to the words. But again, it's the best way I can describe it. There's just huge rage of, you have no right to take over my body. And so I think the rage was necessary to push him out. But that rage came from a sacred place. And I think what might have happened was before I'd been introduced to Michael, was that was Michael stepping in and saying, no. And so that's what happened in my mind. I was like, no, and pushed him away. And he staggered back. And when he staggered back, I ran out the door. Behind me, I heard these like, scream of rage the tyrannosaurus rex scream from the dinosaur movies and a massive cold chill behind me all at the same time and it wasn't a decay like Arr! it kept growing louder and louder like they were coming at me and catching up to me so up the stairs i go I slammed the door shut, and again, this was no thinking on my part. I just did it. I put my hands on the door. I'm thinking, Reiki, 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 and the door disappeared. It just became a wall. And so he tried to come up the stairs, and all of a sudden, there's no door. And so on the other side of this wall, I hear thud and then an exponentially loud roar. And so again, Reiki, Reiki, Reiki. And I had no idea if that was going to hold or not, but I'm like, I'm out. And then I had a startle reflex. And then I woke up in my bed miles away, literally jolted myself awake. Later, like maybe the next semester, I was taking a, a class in um, a short story. And I asked my you know, um, professor, you know, what do you want? Uh, and his, his, his first answer was, uh, keep it like a woman's skirt. And this guy, by the way, this was a Franciscan monk. Keep it like a woman's skirt. Long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to keep my interest. Okay. Oh, wow. Perf. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. But wow. so I wrote an outline of what happened. And then I got the, you know, John, you need to see me after class. All right. I know where this is going because uh, it wasn't it was the first time. <laughs> um, so he pulled me aside. He says, did this really happen? I'm like, yeah, it really happened. And I watered it down. And he kind of sat there and looked up to me and says, do you want to graduate from this college? Yeah then you're going to find a new story. Do not write this story. Okay. Cooperate and graduate. That was my philosophy at the time. I didn't agree with my professors on many things. Um, but cooperate and graduate. So I did. And then maybe 10, 11 years later, I started drip, 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 starting telling that story. And depend upon who I was interfacing with, would I would gauge just how much to divulge. But now I'm at a stage in my life where I don't care. <laughs> right. I've already been dead and back. I already know I'm not going to get judged. I already know I'm loved <laughs> by unconditional love. So well I just want to say John, I mean, so just to because we're gonna get to your we're gonna get to your NDE next, but I think we're all 
just taken aback by that story. I mean, that's that's a Pulitzer Prize award-winning story to me because um, you really are a master. I mean, we are all like, there's we're all masters. Okay, great, thank you. That's so nice of you. We're all masters. But then, like, um, there's the thing of like having a natural instinct that says, I mean, a, a natural ability to let Archangel Michael come through while you're in an astral form and say, you know, I mean, like that's an, that's something that you've already got within you. And then to be able to turn around and rake you the door out of existence. I mean, it's kind of like, it's like inner psychic ninja that's just kind of like hanging out in the background and pops out when you need it. But it's, but that ninja piece is complete. Like that, that inner master piece feels very connected and very complete. Um, and, I, and I just bring that out because I want us all to pay attention to those things that we do naturally and dismiss um, that are wonderful and incredible and we tend to sell short. Um, so, but before we talk about NDE, because John, you're such a good storyteller and I'm like, oh my God, are we gonna get I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to interrupt you and I apologize yeah. for interrupting no, you, but no. I, I want to clarify something you just said. Yeah. I sold myself short for as long as I understood this was my lifetime. Once I discovered my previous lives, I discovered four spontaneously, and now I'm aware of 14 of them. When I look at what I have learned over those 14 lives, what happened with that door disappearing and what happened with that sacred rage, I can find evidence of that in my previous lifetimes. So in that moment, what may have seemed as spontaneous, may have been spontaneous, but I also later discovered I had done something like that. And so in my mind, that gets along to my understanding of reality in the sense that every lifetime you're building and building and growing more complex so that when you're in this meat suit in this time with these set of circumstances, it's because when you were in a pre-corporeal state, you said to your uh, um, cruise director, hey, I, when I go to Earth this time, you know, I did this and this in a previous life, but now I'm going to combine the two and let's amp up the, the complexity or the difficulty level, almost like a video game. I'm going to play the same character, but I want a different weapon this time, and let's make it a little harder, and let's see what happens. And so I think I, I, I bless you for giving me that uh, credibility of saying I, I had that ability. This meat suit in one reality, I would say no. That was God's intervention on my part. Mm. But now that I have that additional learning of my previous lives, oh, I've been a samurai in a previous life. Oh, I've been a magician in a previous life. Oh, I've participated in exorcisms in previous lives. Mm. When I have that corpus of knowledge in this meat suit now, that's why I'm able to access that. I could be completely wrong, but no, I think, I think that's oh, currently on, where you got access to the library. And before I go in, yeah, Linda Hoppin, uh, the ladies need to yeah. hop in and have yeah. some um, stuff here. Go ahead, Linda. Yeah, I think we all have a round of questions. Yeah, I apologize. I'm just like, it's like fascinating. And I, I have to remember to like pull back and be like, okay, everyone talk. <laughs> so mine is a very practical question. I am so curious. How solid did he look to you? When he was taking you around the um, So when I, when I remote view... I see things, um, I guess if you would, if you would take 3D reality and call that a 10, when I dream, I'm seeing things a five out of 10. When I remote view, I see things an eight out of 10. So things appear to be more solid and more real than the dream state, but I also know it's not real. But in the moment when something's trying to possess you, it feels 10 out of 10. <laughs> it's an 11 out of 10 with cowbells. <laughs> and the second question I had was you, you ended that journey in your bed. Where did you start that journey? In bed. 
Um, so when I when I tried to remote view, and again, this goes all the way back to me being 14 and reading Far Journeys, um, they were trying to tell you how to get to an alpha state. And so lay in your bed, get in a quiet space, get into a relaxed mindset, you know, bring down the, the monkey mind, get in that space where you're kind of suggestive, you know, and being 14, it was just like, okay, I'm going to lay down and relax. <sighs> And then I'd wake up a half hour later with drool hanging out the side of my mouth. And I was like, okay, that didn't work. So what I did is I started setting my alarm and I had one of those old alarms where it's like the numbers and it's like the little tiles that click, click, click. So I was trying to meditate, but the click kept bothering me. So I would set the alarm and then put a pillow over it so I wouldn't hear the click. And as I would start falling back into getting relaxed, if I went too far, the alarm would go off and it would bring me back. And I finally learned where I could get to that state of I'm really sleepy and I'm kind of aware of what's going on in reality. You know, I can hear, you know, the lawnmower outside or something, but I was also in my dream state and was kind of going back and forth in that. And that's the alpha state. And that's kind of the goal of meditation or an intentional creation. But when you're 14, it was like, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. And so I got into a place where I know now that if I lie down, it's a darkened state and I'm comfortable, I can almost immediately get into that mindset. And so that's why I was in bed because that's what I taught myself. Now, did you have physical encounters with that ghost while you were on the premises as well? Yes. Yeah. So a, a lot of times it would, it, I would get poked or I get my hair pulled. Um, but most of the time it was uh, after that event, then everything became more antagonistic. So I would turn off lights and I'd close doors uh, or doors that weren't closed. I would walk through them to go do something else. And then behind me, the door would slam. And I mean hard. Uh, it got to the point where I actually called the Indianapolis Police Department because I thought there was an intruder in the house. And the place was, I think, close to 5,600 square feet. Um, and it was in the shape of an L. And it was three floors. So I could be on one side of the house. I'm going up and down the stairs. But there were two other sets of stairs that people could be going up and down. Mm -hmm. And the house is on the Indianapolis uh, uh, Historic Registry. So it's like, if there's someone in here, and they're not a college student, and they're not one of my friends being, you know, uh, a butthead, I've got to protect this house because that is ultimately my responsibility. So I called the IPD, IPD showed up, campus police showed up, the IPD guy had a canine unit. And so we had four guys, four grown ass men. Well, I was mostly grown ass um, going through this house and working our way up so that we would eventually trap whoever in the attic space. And we finally got to the attic, and this is where that uh, hot box sauna and storage place was. We all got to the one point of access, very narrow, very dark staircase. Again, typical Hollywood, you know. Don't go up the dark staircase uh, into the attic. So we all stood at the foot of this, <laughs> trying to decide, all right, who wants to be the first one to go up the scary staircase? Uh, and the guy with the canine unit is like, I'll go. And then he looks at the dog, go. <laughs> the dog goes up about two steps, stops, turns around, goes back behind the handler and sits down. He orders the dog up the steps again. Dog goes up and then backs up, not losing eyesight or eye contact with the door at the top. And he backs back down the stairs, sat down next to his handler and whined. The canine handler says, if he's not going, I'm not going. So it's like, okay, you stay down here. We'll go up. So the security guard, the other IP guy, and myself, we go up the stairs. We split off in the two directions. We come back. There's nothing. We come back down the stairs. We're back on that landing again, and we're talking about, well, what could it have been? Was it a wind? Was it a raccoon? You know, there's a forest nearby. There's a golf course across the street. Maybe some critter. And we're having this debate on what it could or could not be. And at the top, boom, the door slammed shut. Okay, we're out. 
Mic drop, Seacrest out. <laughs> so yeah, we 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 um, we had I had that going for about another year, and then what happened was is there was a um, uh, Indianapolis had a like a decorator show home event, and what they did is they went through and decorators went through and did like five or ten famous houses in Indianapolis, and then you bought like a fifty dollar ticket to go see what the decorators had done in these places decorators came in and completely blew the place out and changed everything so there was so much energy and so much going on at that point that the focus on me and torturing me was nearly completely gone and i'm sure i'm sure um mr stokely is pissed off that you know, my bed got moved and this office got changed and what do you mean you're repainting the walls you know it's been this way for 60 years you're you're screwing with my house so he had many other things to deal with at that point uh, and then after it was the decorator show home and it got nice and pretty then they moved administrative offices in and they moved the music department to another building so i never had to go back there after that thankfully Ms. Angela, hop yeah. in and ask John, do some yeah. cross-examination here. <laughs> so I have more of a, I guess more of a comment than a than a question. But it's 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 interesting to me to listen to the story and think about how we erect these elaborate screenplays for ourselves, right? To remind us of who we really are. Because in a in an incarnation, we are the amalgamation of all that we've lived through mm -hmm. all lifetimes, through all time and space. And we carry that forward. But the thing is remembering, like working through the veil of remembrance. And so listening to your story, it's like you, you left yourself breadcrumbs. You were already open. Your grandfather, that interaction opened you a little bit more. And then you found the box of books, which gave you the pieces, the elements of things, skills that you already had that you had to remind yourself of. And then there was a process of you tinkering with those, those things in the toolbox, remembering what's in the toolbox, remembering all that is part of who you are. And then that story of uh, interacting with the ghost, it's like a call to stand in your power, to realize the power that you hold, the ability to move between the realms, the physical and the uh, spiritual realms and open into that. And then sharing that story with your professor, learning how to share that story in a way that's palatable and being able to be comfortable sharing that story and not downplaying or playing small for their comfort, but being able to stand in your truth and share your truth in a, in a place of authenticity. It's like, it's like we establish these elaborate screenplays and they're all different because we create our own realities, correct? So it's like we, we, we do this and, and play out these screenplays in these different ways, but the themes are all the same. We have these tools, we are spiritual beings, we are spiritual beings living in a physical plane, reminding ourselves of who we truly are, and then owning that and being able to live that as authentically um, as possible. So I'm appreciative of the story because there were so many parallels to my own story of being called to stand in that power, being able to see a ghost and not run the other way, but turn and face it without fear, understanding that the fear is just, no, there was fear. Uh, yes. I, I mean, but you, but you stood, but you stood, there was a point where you were called to stand and face it. And that's what you did. And that that's, that's an ownership of the power that you hold over what you perceive to be a fear, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the story from uh, that respect because um, a lot of us can downplay and uh, acquiesce to those fears and choose rather not to face it. But listening to that story, there's an encouragement for people who are who may be listening to stand and face and understand that there is no fear. There is no nothing to fear because you have power over all that you've created, all that you may perceive to be fear because you are the creator of your um, experience in whatever way you've chosen to play that life out and remind yourself of the bigger aspect that you truly are. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and 
everyone's reality is different because reality is is subjective and it's viewed through the lens of our experiences now granted we all share a collective subset there is a venn diagram of what we all agree to to have earth function but then we also have that separate stuff that makes us us so with that being said i i i would I would tweak one of the things you said that there there is a difference between standing and your power which is what i would call knowledge but then there's also standing in your power power but having the ability to discriminate who your audience is mm. and that's the wisdom and so for the longest time i've been collecting knowledge i've been going out and collecting experiences what is a past life? What is a near-death experience? What is a remote viewing? What is all of this? But in that knowledge gathering, it took me into my 40s before I realized just to have knowledge is not enough. You need to have the wisdom to know what to share. Because if you give somebody too much information at once, you overload them and then they shut down. They can still look at you and, you know, do this kind of nonverbal thing, but they're out. And I experienced that as a nurse when, you know, when, so I worked at a cancer center in Indianapolis where if you failed cancer therapy at your regional hospital, then you came to us. So you were already not in your best place when you came to us. And I would have conversations with my with my patients that one o'clock in the morning conversation is, okay, I'm your healthcare proxy. Am I fighting for you to leave? Or am I fighting for you to leave? Are you wanting to go another round? Or are you done? And I will then go out into the world and be your healthcare proxy and I will fight for that. But we need to have a come to Jesus moment. And you tell me, what am I doing for you? Sometimes, like I may have a 17-year-old patient. That conversation I have with them is going to be different than the conversation I have with the 75-year-old who's in their third or fourth round of chemo and have just said, so having the wisdom of discernment, I think, is one of the lessons I've had to learn in the sense of I can accumulate this knowledge. I can then stand in my power. But my audience, I can't overwhelm them. And again, that's where the paramedic aspect comes in. I'm going to grab you up. And then I'm going to nudge you in a direction that I think is the best for you. But again, if you've been a parent, if you've been a healthcare provider, you you give what you have in that moment, but then you have to surrender because they're going to leave your influence. And you can only hope that they have taken with you that lesson. But if I give you too much, then you're like, oh, or if I overwhelm your sense of reality, then it's like, oh, everything you say must be, it must be false. Right. You get dismissed right away. Hey, Seashell, hop in because we want to get your voice in here too. Do, what would you like to ask the lovely John? You know, John, I am just sitting here fascinated with your, your story. You know, you know, I've read about you and, and stuff. We've never really talked and this is so cool. I love how it's like you just walk into these situations and those on the other side are almost like grabbing you by the tie and like joint, you know, you're coming with me. And that's pretty cool because that's very similar to my experiences where it's like I've just walked into situations and being there's something about certain I'm, I'm sure it's energy fields and I'm sure it's related to consciousness, too. You know, like you were saying, Angela, you know, where you're at in that kind of a situation to where they can come in and interact with you like that. And being in the haunted house and being around, you know, those on the other side that are still inhabiting those spaces and you having that kind of interaction is absolutely fascinating. Um, and one of the things I want to ask you is, do you still to this day, 
<laughs> go into kind of what, what we could maybe throw in the basket of paranormal situations. Are you still doing stuff like that or have you kind of stepped away from it? Oh, it just continues to grow. Okay. Uh, so right up, just before my near-death experience, I started doing um, uh, Silva method, Jose Silva, Silva mind method, yeah. Silva mind control. In the 70s, it was Silva mind control. And then MK Ultra came out. I was like, mm, mind control is probably not a good thing for marketing. <laughs> uh, so now it's Silva method. But that's where I learned I have the ability to be a medical intuitive. I also learned that I could do remote viewing and I could uh, control where in time I'm remote viewing to. I, I, Silva technique was a way for me to organize and categorize everything I'd been scooping up. Because like, I was just like throwing everything. It's like when family comes over unannounced and you just throw everything into that spare room. <laughs> that was my metaphysical process. I just throw everything into this room and, and I'll deal with it later. <clears throat> when I discovered Silva, it gave me a structure. Oh, so this is remote viewing. This is out of body. This and and yeah. at the end of that, I had a gentleman tell me, um, uh, Kane. I can't remember Kane's last name. I should have I should have prepped us. Uh, anyway, Kane told me he says there is no rule that says you can't combine these things. And that's when I had like oh. <gasps> Everything I mentioned to you so far may have sound interesting to you, but for me, it was just life. Yeah. But that's when the first thunderclap went off in my head of like, oh, wow. And so this became my tagline for a while. I remote view a previous life. I communicate with that spirit I explain why their transition is about to happen. I give them Reiki in that moment to ease that transition. And then when I come back to my meat suit and my reality, I do an internal assessment to see, was that helpful? Yeah. And so I'm combining remote viewing and Reiki and past lives all at the same time. And I had no idea that you could do that. And then I tried it again, grip it and rip it. Oh my God, this happened. And I had chronic injuries from football and a couple of car wrecks. I went back to previous lives and it was like, oh, somebody stabbed me with a, a saber in that lifetime. And so I apply Reiki to that wound. And when I came forward to this lifetime, that chronic injury went away. Like, holy shit balls, is this how this works? Then the near death happened, and then it just completely I mean, I thought things were weird and interesting up to that point, and then the near death <laughs> happened, and then everything got kicked up to eleven. Like when I first came back from my near death experience, I'd walk under street lights and the street lights would turn on mm -hmm. in daylight. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> what? I'd walk under uh UV lights that like the the fluorescent lights that you kind of like have to pop in and then roll for them to click in. They've got the ballast. I'd walk under those and those things would start to like shimmer. Well, let's what? talk about, <laughs> <laughs> let, let's talk about some I of the life it. that you, I'm um, sorry, Michelle. Do you have anything, anything else you want to say, Michelle? I don't mean to cut you off, love. Oh, oh, well, one thing I'm, I'm, thank you so much for putting it in that context that it all goes together. Cause that's how I work too. It's like everything just kind of gets thrown in a basket and it all mushes together and then it becomes. And that's what I, I was that told I'm that's so a shamanic practice. Oh, wow. That's a, yeah. I that was told be. by someone who is a shaman. So yeah. this is the shamanic practice. You go through trials and tribulations and they either either become wounds that identify you or they <sighs> become skills yeah. that identify you and you choose what they're going to be. Yeah, and wow. as you gather them all together and start doing that alchemical process of bringing all these different elements together and create that synergistic process of where the the result is greater than the sum of the parts, yes, that is the shamanic practice. Again, I feel like I need to be wearing a grass skirt. 
uh, and, uh, you know, eating grubs to be a shaman. Uh, and that I'll eat escargot and I'll eat sushi. That's about as crazy as I'll get. Okay. Uh, if and you'll you wear call a coconut a shaman, bra. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, I'm more, I'm more comfortable with spiritual paramedic because I think that covers well, the whole gambit. And it translates better probably to your particular audience. And Archangel Michael says, it was Archangel Michael, right? He said yeah. so. So there it is. Um, like a, he gave you your, your, your calling card, which is brilliant. Um, do any of the, our lovely ladies have any other questions before? Because I want to talk about a little bit more about you healing your, your past life stuff and how that looked, because I think that's a good template for people. I want to talk about the NDE so bad, but like, I feel like we should talk about the past life healing stuff before we move forward, because if people have this understanding of how that can work, we can all start doing that. And I feel like it's an educational moment. Are, are Michelle, Angela, and Linda okay to proceed? Get thumbs ups. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, ladies. So hit it, John. Tell us about some of your past life of you going into healing your, your past life chisel and give us some of those stories. So we kind of have a, we can be with you in the experience because that's how at least I learn. So the, the, the past life healing was an evolution. And my evolutionary process was, I grew up, I grew up in an abusive household and the dynamic was dad was the enforcer, mom legitimized it, and I was the designated victim. And so in that process, um, you get to the point of where you are not the driver, you are the victim. And so everything that happens that's negative, you have already been pre-programmed to have an external source for that. You know, why did you get a ticket? Oh, because the cop was there, not because you were speeding. Um, and so you start looking at external um, sources for these things. But during the process, uh, I think it was probably in my late 20s when I started uncovering previous lives. And I started seeing that, wow, this is a thing that I did in a previous lifetime that I'm doing now. Well, why am I doing it now? If I did it then, why am I doing it now? It's like, I'm not learning anything. But in that discovery of I'm not learning anything was the awareness. I have the awareness that I was doing that in a previous life. And so now I have the onus of responsibility of deciding, is this something, is this a trauma that's going to affect me negatively? Or is this a tool that I can add to my toolbox and use it positively? Then it grew from that to, I could not be here. And this, this was an idea that I had until I had my near-death experience. But the idea was, maybe I'm not the victim. Maybe I asked for these things as part of my Akashic record selection or my cosmic Costco. Before I knew what the Akashic record was, I called it the cosmic Costco. You know, I got my grocery cart and I'm going through and it's like, oh, let me take some depression. Let me take some abandonment. Um, oh, bankruptcy. That's a good one. Let's throw that in here. And that'll be my, you know, meat suit this time around. But then the next evolution after the near death experience was it's an amusement park. We're choosing these rides to ride. You want to be depressed, be depressed. You want to go through bankruptcy, go through bankruptcy. There's no winning or losing. It's a lesson. Winning or losing is defined by society and society has its own agenda and elevating you to your highest, greatest good is not society's agenda. <laughs> so, the evolutionary process ended up with me being in a state of mind where I am currently, and it's been this way for a few years, so I think I want to keep it. When I incorporated into this meat suit, I went to the Cosmic Costco, I selected the things I'd previously done, like a video game. Yeah, I'm going to choose the same character and I'm going to have some of the same things, but this time I'm going to choose different scenarios or different tools, or maybe let's make it a little harder. Or let's add in uh, um, a, another uh, a character to assist me with this learning process. 
But in the end, what happened was I was empowered. I was no longer the victim. In 3D reality, it may look like I'm the victim. Because, yeah, dad did, uh, you know, hit for distance and accuracy. But if I had not worked with him in a precorporeal state to say, if you, if you abuse me as a child, what's going to happen is that I'm going to be driven to make people feel better. Because when dad's happy, then the beatings don't happen. So if I can make people happy, then I'm safer. Well, in your 20s and 30s, are, let me back this up to even larger. In religion, sometimes people are good because they're afraid God's going to smite them. Just wait till your father gets home. Okay, well, I better be good so I don't get caught and get, you know, get beat. But then later on in the New Testament, it's, it's not, I'm going to smite thee. It's, I love you. And then you have that kind of maturation where I'm going to do good, not because I'm afraid of getting beaten, but because good in and of itself is a cool thing to do. And this also was an idea, but in my near-death experience, it became solidified. God is unconditional love. God doesn't care if you're Mother Teresa or Hitler. God is unconditional love. And it's hard sometimes for people who think with their human mind that someone can be worthy of God's love regardless of what they've done. And that's also where I got the near-death experience of, you're all ascended masters. To be here on earth right now, earth is the wild, wild west. And so for you to be here right now, you're an ascended master. Maybe you're a bad guy, but you need to play the role of a bad guy in this lifetime so that you can be the foil for the person that's learning to become a hero. And when you all come back, then you all shake hands and it's just a play and it was just, you know, um, it's just a ride. It's just an amusement park ride. But so in that process, I went from I'm a victim to maybe I'm not a victim. Maybe these are things of my own choices and I need to stop looking at external things as the reasons to this is all a big play. And as the actor and the director of this play, I can choose. Do I want to perceive this as being the victim or do I want to choose to perceive this as being a learning experience that I can incorporate, put into my toolbox, and later on down the road when I discover someone else who is a victim, um, ask them, are you really a victim or are you just playing a role? What does this, how does this serve you? And then can we find something else to meet that need that isn't victim? Let's find something heroic that will meet that need. And then life gets really fun. Then it gets interesting. Do you have a couple examples of the, 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 when you were doing the Reiki, like what the process was like, so you went to a meditative state, you had sort of an astral body experience of meeting a past self. Like how did that play out? How did the mechanics of you giving your past life Reiki, past selves Reiki look? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I could describe it. Um, I'll just describe it. And yeah. there, there are aspects of it that are remote viewing. There are aspects of it that are Reiki. There's aspects of it that is an out-of-body experience. And rather than try to tease all that out, maybe you'll need to have me back on another uh, interview. Sounds good. And I'll explain that. But essentially, you get to this nice, calm place. You're going to start doing your meditation or remote viewing. And you set the intention of where and when you want to go. And so through a hypnotic practice with a regression therapist, I was able to identify these 14 individuals. So when I go to meditate, it's like, I want to go see this person. There's one person I've worked with a lot, and he was a sea captain in the 1800s. So I want to go see the captain. And I want to see him right before he has his traumatic injury. And so I go to my meditative state. 
I go to remote view and instead of remote viewing a location in 3D reality or underground or off planet, you go to that time space, that XYZ coordinate where that being is. Sometimes they see you, sometimes they don't. When they do see you, I do the same thing that I do when I remote view haunted places because they'll see me, the ghosts see me. And so I introduce myself. Hi, my name is John. I'm here to help you. You are about to go through this transition. There is going to be pain, but with this pain comes knowledge and wisdom that your soul will carry on board for eternity. So I'm going to help you with this process. I'm not going to change the process because it's necessary. And when we get on the other side of it, we'll all be better for it. And so the sea captain, he has a load shift during the storm. One of the crates come tumbling down. It breaks his leg just below his knee. And it's during a storm and everyone's down below and so he has to cut his own leg off to get out from under the crate he army crawls up the steps back to the wheel ties himself to the wheel ties his leg off so he doesn't bleed out and he manages to continue steering the ship until the storm subsides and people start coming back up top deck again and then that's where they discover him it's like oh my god our captain's nearly dead he's tied himself off and so then comes the process of him he gets healed he becomes a peg leg back in those days you're seen as less of a man even though he was everything else he was a captain he saved the crew he saved the shipment he saved the ship they had a hero's weapon welcome for him when he came back that didn't matter he saw himself as less of a man and within a year, he had drunk himself to death and by the very end, committed suicide. In that process, I knew there was a lot of pain and depression. Depression is something that I have in this lifetime. And so my goal was to let's find the strongest roots of depression and let's mitigate that. So that in this lifetime, I don't want to strip away the lesson that is depression but my god the gravita the gravitas of that some days i can't get out of bed and if i'm not getting out of bed i'm not learning so mitigate the damage but don't lose the lesson and so that was my intention going into that lifetime of okay this is what's going to happen i'm going to ease you through that i'm not going to change any of the facts i'm going to mitigate the pain and then later on i had the aha experience it's like this is what i learned in nursing for ptsd treatment you don't try to get the person to forget the fact or the event what you do is you disassociate the pain that comes with that fact later on like i think this was 2018 I started doing something called ketamine therapy. And so I would go to an IV clinic, I get ketamine on board, I would go into a disassociative state, but on a scale of one to 10, I can disassociate it maybe what I thought was a 10, I was disassociated like a five, six, seven. I got ketamine, IV ketamine, and I'm disassociating 11 out of 10. I mean, I'm back in communication with that unconditional love. I'm having a near death experience without the pesky death part while on the ketamine. And so I'm having that conversation with that entity, which I would later come to term as a trans dimensional entity. And when I tried to identify this person or this thing as God, they were like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. You're guilty, Lily. That's too much. And I'm like, well, then what are you? And they said, well, I'm the architect okay what does that mean he says i create reality i co-create reality with you I'm like which one he goes all of them 
what? He says, every decision you make perpetuates the next reality. But in order for you to have free will, I have to co-create all possible realities. But as you make decisions, those increase and then decrease exponentially. And so I create all potential realities until you make a choice, and then we could collapse all the ones that are no longer necessary, and then build out the next one, and the next one, and the next one. I'm like, that's got to be exhausting. He goes, eh, it happens in a moment. Okay. So to answer your question, that's where this is, that's one of the places this has gone to, is no, I've yeah. not stopped. It gets increasingly more complex and more interesting and fascinating as I go. Well, I think you've given us a huge recipe on how to work and heal on ourselves, how to be our own spiritual paramedics, which is a very empowering piece. Um, I mean, obviously you have to do the work of, you know, meditation and learning how to do, do the technique and learning how to do the skill. Um, that is a prerequisite but you've given us a recipe and a formula. And I'm wondering, do you do this for other people, John? Like if I was like, hey, John, I have this root thing that keeps coming up over and over again. I have abandonment that keeps coming up over and over again. I've tackled it here, I've tackled it there. Are you able to go into one of my past lives and talk to myself and help triage that moment where this, this core thing is coming through and then come back like the shaman with the knowledge and the wisdom. I'm going to experience it in my life, but you come back sort of with the text of what happened because you can relate it back to me. Is that a service that you could offer to somebody or have you ever tried it? Oh, I've definitely tried it. I've been, I've been doing it for years. Um, I've just God. never tried to hang my shingle out as that. Okay. But well, family I'm, I'm and friends. with that one because that's a big <laughs> shingle. I'm just saying. Okay. So family, friends, whatever. So if you would come to me, uh, with that ask, then what I would say is, well, first of all, do I have your permission to do Reiki and um, to do a tarot card reading? And when I get into that mindset or that when I'm open to that, not only do I get the tarot feed and not only do I get the Reiki feed, but when I've opened myself up, all of a sudden these intuition things start turning on. and I was like, oh, I see recently you've had some abandonment issues. And a lot of times people are, people are pretty much familiar with referred pain. So it's like, I've got this, you know, pain in my shoulder or my neck. It turns out it isn't a stress injury. It's emotional stress that has now manifested as physical stress because you didn't address the emotion. So a lot of times when I do Reiki on a physical ailment, the emotional source pops into my head. Did you just recently come out of the army or did you just recently have a, a regimented structure that is now no longer present? And, oh yeah, I did. It's because sometimes it's a metaphor and sometimes it's reality. Oh yeah, I did recently come out of the army or I was in a very tightly controlled marriage and that's gone. And I'm happy to have that control out of my, my, out of my life and my system. But now I'm trying to figure out now what is my reality because I've had that structure. And even though it had its negative components, it also had positive components as well. And now that I have no structure, now what do I do with my life? And so through my Reiki, through the tarot, through the messages that come through, what I do is I then lean into my nursing. And what they teach you is nursing, you do a, a nurse's assessment. So I do all your vital signs. I take your, your, your family history, your social history. And as I'm, and again, I didn't realize I was doing this at the time, but as a nurse, as I'm pulling in all this data and in my mind, I'm like, okay, show me the picture. You know, they tell you like, don't go hunting zebras in medicine. They'll say, don't go hunting zebras. Just because you hear galloping doesn't mean you're looking for zebras. Sometimes it's just a horse. Just because you got a cough and a sneeze and a post-nasal drip doesn't mean you have COVID. It could be you just have seasonal allergies. So as I'm gathering all this data in and trying to make a cohesive picture, in that process, I come up with a medical pathway. And I'm constantly assessing as we go down the pathway to make sure I'm on the right pathway. I do the same thing as the spiritual paramedic. I've done the tarot, I've done the Reiki, I've pulled in. 
uh, I've and I've asked my uh, white brotherhood to to come in and and give me that information. Then I come up with a picture and say, this is what I have seen. And if it resonates with that person, most times it does, not always, but most times it does. And then it says, okay, here's how I would move forward if I were in your situation. Here are some books I've read. Here are some people I've talked to. Here are some podcasts that I know. Here's, you know, and again, that's where the paramedic aspect of it is. I I don't feel it's my responsibility to fix you or heal you because you are the driver of that process. You are the healer. You just sometimes need to be reminded of it or you need to be put on a path or given a Sherpa that can give you a few steps along that pathway. I'm not that dude. I can nudge you in that direction though using my highest and greatest good and my intention so that you achieve what it is you're trying to achieve. What I see in my mind when you talk about what you do is that you reform a base beneath the person so they have something to stand on and they, then they can take forward movements. But you really are good from my firsthand experience of meeting somebody where they're shattered and being able to be neutral, loving, and, and put a foundation back beneath them with their own you know, conscious engagement. And then that gives them tools and a support and a perspective to be able to move forward. That's my two cents. I wanted you to define, to let us know who the White Brotherhood are so people know that we're not supporting the KKK. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I didn't even <laughs> think about that. Oh my God. Um, can we delete that? Holy cow. No, it's um, okay. People, there is a thing called the White Brotherhood, but yes. it's spiritual. It has nothing to do with the yeah, color yeah. of your skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the very first things, so when I came back from my near-death experience, I immediately wanted to get back to that space because it's like, culture shock. Uh, and I, I've written about this, I've talked about this, and I've given presentations on this. Uh, doctors who do near-death research have talked about this. Half the people who have a near-death experience come back and they have no idea what the hell to do with everything they got they got downloaded with. Thank you. There's the map book. Okay, so yeah. in oh, the process of, of my reassimilation, and because of my near-death experience being forced through lung injury, I wanted to do a sweat lodge, but I didn't think my lungs would allow me to go through the sweat lodge experience. So I'm trying to figure out how do I get to that disassociative but positive emotional state. And so I'm wandering through the bookstore and then I see this book that says map on the front of it. I'm like, okay, that doesn't look like a map. And so I pick it up and it's the medical assistance program. I think, is it program? Is that the P? Medical assistance? So yes, program medical assistance program. So what this is, is a tutorial on, there is a group of energies who identify themselves as the white brotherhood. And they are people who have been here as humans and have accelerated up the ladder. But instead of keeping reaching up, they're now reaching back to offer a hand up. Also part of this group are people who have never been human, but they affiliate with the human experience. They are true ascended masters or angels, maybe if you want to frame it that way, in the sense they've not been human, but they admire the struggle that they have agreed to accept. And so this collective is available. And if when I started doing Reiki, every once in a while, these symbols, you know, when you're doing Reiki, you have symbols that flow through your head. Some of the symbols you've been given, some of the symbols come through you through intu intuition, but these symbols kind of adjust your energy as your feeding energy to the other person. Every once in a while, I would see a symbol that was a torch, but it was a alabaster hand, almost like a statue in marble an alabaster hand holding on to an alabaster staff and it was a torch and the flame was silver, white, neon, the, the purest, the only time I've seen a white close to that was in my near death experience that in that tunnel. And so I'm like, wow, that's a really cool symbol. 
And I noticed that when I was doing healing on people that were terminal or people that were really, really sick, I would see that symbol. And I'm like, I got to figure out what that symbol is. Well, I'm reading map and they're talking about the white brotherhood. And I'm like, okay. And well, what are these guys? And so I'm reading a little more. And again, typical Y chromosome infected individual. I get through two thirds of the book and I'm like, okay, I know enough. And I chip aside and I'm like, okay, let's rip it and rip it and see what happens. And so I, again, set my intention to astral project, but I wanted to project to where the white brotherhood was located because I wanted to commune with them. And so I set my intention. I went there. I was in this white space, undefined, except in the middle, there was a bonfire. The rocks were all marble. The fire was all white and silver and neon, just like that torch. I'm like, oh, wow, this is cool. What's that? And then all of a sudden, these people just kind of appeared, and they're all like Gandalf. They're all wearing these white robes. They were some males, some females, some of them androgynous. But they all just kind of appeared and just kind of manifested. And I'm like, are you guys the White Brotherhood? And yes, we are. And so I had my conversation with them. And then they said, we've been with you. You just didn't know. And I'm like, well, how would I have known that? And then that's when I got the imagery of the alabaster hand holding the alabaster torch and the silver. I was like, oh, that's what that is. And so that is the White Brotherhood. And they've been with me as I've been doing Reiki before I even knew who or what they were. Dang. Michelle, have you had any experiences with the white brotherhood? I see you just like vibing on this. <laughs> totally. totally. She's sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, John, I'm like, I think I've been just walking parallel with you. Everything you're talking about. I'm like, dude, um, see, you should have talked to me about a year ago. <laughs> Well, I, you know what, this is just how shit goes down sometimes. <laughs> Word. <laughs> Everything in divine order. It is, all, it is all good. You know, I'm going to bust very... your chops just a little bit. <laughs> you, that's okay. You bust away. I'm tough. I can handle it. Um, I had a very similar experience where I had this, that knee on color light and i kept seeing the hand like coming like like there follow this follow this and i was like whatever and i wasn't really into this stuff a little bit but not much but i had someone give me that map book it's like you need you need this and i'm like yeah whatever Mm -hmm. did kind of a, a a pattern there of yeah that looks great okay we set it aside and, but it was weird because it kept showing up. Like I went, um, I put it in my suitcase. I got home, unpacked, went to go somewhere else, packed the suitcase, never saw the book, got to where I was going. All of a sudden the book is on top there and I needed to use that. And that's when I was introduced to who this map team is. Uh, and, and how was, fortuitous that Linda would join us late, but still is here and have and that have book, book within reach right there. The universe yeah. is conspiring. Yes, <laughs> and I kind yes, of want to bring study the map book. There's a yeah. edition, and everybody has helped me through lots in my life, lots of times. It's called on the yeah. map team. Yeah, yeah. And I I'm introduction was a tiny, tiny little book from a place, and when I went back to get it because I lost it, they said, "I don't know what you're talking about." And so yeah. I didn't find it until literally a week ago. I found wow. it. Wow. Uh, so in the, in, in the back of my head right now, I'm hearing thunderous applause. <laughs> Me too. So that's, the, that's the cheeky bastards that I have to work with. <laughs> and you know what? I Can I add really quick what I'm getting is everybody who's listening, pay attention. Because this is for you guys. This is for you guys to hear this today, because this group 
who has been working in the ethers, they are becoming more apparent to those of us who are open and ready for it. So the map team's coming and you guys are listening to this. Listen, pay attention, maybe even get the book, you know, start paying attention because I feel like I'm seeing all these beings and I see them as kind of like a Gandalf too, John, knocking on doors, like going down the, the hallway, bing, 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 wake up, pay attention, mm. bing, 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 bing. So yeah. that's one of the messages that I got when I was arguing to stay. Um, they were like, no, you need to go back. The, you need to be a spiritual paramedic. Yeah. And I'm like, why? And the, this time right now in the evolution of our collective process is the most dynamic and dangerous at the same time. Yeah. And it has to be that way because it's like in math when they talk about the lowest common denominator. There are some people who can learn by seeing others touch the stove. There are others who can learn by just knowing stoves are hot and I probably shouldn't touch them. But the lowest common denominator among the human animal is the dork who touches the stove, gets burned and says, wow, that was really hot. I wonder if it'll do it again. <laughs> and they touch it again and they get burned again. And they're like, well, that was really hot that time, too. No, Maybe John, I should touch lowest, it again. The lowest common denominator is the one that calls their friend over and says, hey, touch the stove. <laughs> <laughs> that really, yeah, yeah. This tastes terrible. Try it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, right. why? Hey, this milk smells bad. Tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, hey. And oh, just, I, I don't want to interrupt you, John, but I want Angela to be able to hop in because I, I think everyone's got feedback on what you what you're saying. Okay. Is that cool? All right. You wanted me to chime in? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have anything to add right Oh, right I saw here. you come off mute. So I thought, okay. Um, all right, Miss Linda. <laughs> you're good. I've yeah, stunned I'm, everyone into silence. Yeah. <laughs> you're a good storyteller. Really What's well, funny, so I, a few years ago, I was at a, a uh, an assist conference, uh, American Society for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Events. It's a mouthful, um, but it's A-C-I-S-T-E dot org. If you have had the near-death experience but didn't have the pesky death part as part of your denouement or as part of your spiritual epiphany um that is where i would lead you so a lot of times people either have a a traumatic event that isn't physical in nature um mushrooms or some other psychodynamic thing where you've peeled back the realities that you've constructed over the years and realized that it's all been a facade and it's like oh god now what do i do this is one of the things i would probably recommend this is a group that was started about eight years ago by a person who is an ethnographer which means instead of studying near-death experiences from a case study point of view they live with these people and they get the day-to-day -day experience of what it's like to be with them so to read that oh i came back from my near-death experience prior to that i was uh, a mormon and now uh i'm a uh, a wiccan with psychic abilities. I'm not making that up. That's one of the case studies I came across. I can read about that, but if I lived with that person for two or three months, so completely different experience. It's like I can either read about baking a cake or I can bake a cake. That experiential knowledge is different. So she went and lived with people who had this Satori, this epiphany, this denouement, and again, the same parallels exist. 
in the sense that you have this change in your reality and that manifests in reality as I might get a divorce. I might start a new job. I might go back to school. I might, you do a control out delete on all the things in your life that don't serve your next chapter. And for the Reiki masters that are out there, this is the advice I got from a Reiki master when um, I did Reiki one, then I did Reiki two, two years later, and then I waited to be recognized. And it was seven years until I was recognized before I became a master. When talking with that person, I said, what can I expect? And they got this little grin on their face and they said, when you become a Reiki master, what you're actually saying is you're agreeing to be mastered by Reiki. I'm like, wow. okay, what does that mean? Yeah. It says anything that doesn't serve your next evolution, you'll either need to let go or it'll be stripped from you. Boom. That was a knowledge bomb. And I thought there was a few things that think, ah, I can muscle through this. I can hold through this. No. And it, and it was a complete surrender. Divorce, job change, religion change, friends change. I moved 900 miles away to a place where nobody knew me. I completely restarted my life. And better for it. Wow. And this, this was pre-NDE or related to the NDE? It was after the NDE. It was post NDE. Okay. Yes. So my NDE so, was 05 and my um, Ricky Master was 09. Okay. 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 Because so I was thinking you, okay. All right. Wow. Okay. So here's the deal. We have got like 14 minutes left. So John, November, or I'm sorry, not November, February 5th, we'd like to have you back on. That's an open date. So we can talk about your NDE because I am no way going to squash that into the last 12 minutes. Um, okay. and, and I think that, uh, I mean, yeah, I think universally, we just saw something magical happen here with all the whole map business and the white brotherhood. So let's uncork that a little bit more, give them some more play space with us so we can do, um, bring you, bring out the rest of what you're doing and, and the rest of uh, your NDE into people's experience. Cause yeah, you, you have such packets of wisdom with each experience. It's like, you give us the experience and then you unshell the the packets of wisdom so we get what you got during it and it's it's done so very well um do you my ladies here have any other thoughts or questions for john i do great of course i do linda, course you do. linda with a y linda with a y y'all <laughs> bring it so john um one of the things that um I know a lot of the people I work with, a lot of people in my lives and I've had in the past that I think I, for myself personally, I think I've come to the realization for myself that when you have someone that says, why on earth would I pick all these horrible things? Why on earth would I choose or anyone choose to be starving in Africa? Why would anyone choose to be molested? Why would anyone choose these in their lives? How can you help um, rephrase that for them in their thoughts or, or allow them a different possibility than victimhood? I can tell you how I resolved that for me. So one of the events in my lifetime in this life was I had to turn off life support on both my parents. That could be extremely emotional. And how you choose to frame that can it get back to what we said earlier. I can either choose to let this be a trauma that I will then use that trauma as how I identify myself, or I can use this as a lesson and make it into a tool that will allow me to serve others. 
I would like to say that I was this illuminated person and I immediately went to the second choice. I did not. My father passed away first and he had end-stage renal disease. We knew this was coming. We just didn't know when. And part of that preparation was dad asking me, will you help me write my will? Will you help me write my living will? Will you help me write my power of attorney? Yes, dad, I will do that. As a child, this is the person who was the propagator of my pain. In my 30s, this was a fellow, fellow traveler through time that we have been playing roles together for a millennia. And in one of my past lives, I discovered he was my twin brother during the, um, the Crusades. And in this lifetime, we both had the same birthday, November 5th. We were just 24 years apart that kind of the echo that sometimes happened from previous lives into this life. But in that process of turning off life support, I heard in my head, um, some to the effect, and I can't, it just jumped out. Um, farewell to the king, long live the king. Dad passed away. I'm here easing that transition, the passage of the torch. And I later came to realize that I don't think we as humans truly can step into our full authentic selves until our parents have left. Because you're always their baby. You're always their kid. There's always that historian that can remember that time you crapped your diapers in the middle of the church, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. Well, that's gone. And so there is no one to give you that structure of that history. And so once your parents leave, you are finally past the last threshold of becoming the autonomous adult that you should be. I could be wrong, but that's something that at least happened to me. When my mom passed away, from the same disease process, just 10 years later, same thing. The little boy in me was, I don't want to lose my mommy, just like I lost my daddy. The clinician in me, they need to go because they are in so much pain and suffering. They've earned the right to go home. And at the metaphysical level was, this is their last lesson. When we stood on the playground in our pre-corporeal meat, or before we stepped into our meat suit, what all are we going to learn? Well, John, what do you want to learn? Well, I want to learn blah, blah, blah. Mom says, I can teach you this. This will be my last lesson. And so I went from a place of turning off life support on my parents was a horror to the process of turning off life support on my parents was an honor. They gave me that last gift, that last lesson. And I'm going to make it a tool so that when I encounter others, who have a parent who passes, I can then empathize as well as sympathize. I can scrape them up, put them into a, a container and hand them off to the next person. So that's, that's, um, that's probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned so far is that Things can happen and you can choose for it to be a tragedy or a tool. And right now in 2022, mm -hmm. with COVID 
and the economy and mm -hmm. everything that's going on, you can choose which amusement park ride to ride and what lesson you want, if any. On that note, John, we, we have got like five minutes left. And so um, I'm going to put this into Brady Bunch view. So um, Michelle, stop picking your nose. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Here's a story. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted uh, John to give us your last bit of wisdom and your invitation to us, John. We have, I have all your links below, but what's your invitation to us so we can get to know you more? Ha. Huh. I feel like y'all know me pretty good at this point. <laughs> and we've not There's talked about the near-death experience. We've not talked about remote viewing off-planet and seeing what else is out there. Well, we're going to have uh, you back for that, Shizzle. But how can people, between now and February 5th, you can come back to that date. How can, what do you want people to do? How can we connect with you? What's your offering? So in 2015, I sent uh, out a draft of a manuscript. And I had just gone out to California to be part of a movie called Conversations with God. And that's where I discovered Neil Donald Walsh. And I got to meet Neil Donald Walsh. And I wrote this manuscript. I put it away. Four years later, 2019, I rediscover it. I tweak it up a little bit. And again, the cheeky monkey popped up. And when Neil sent his manuscript to a potential literary agent he said read to page 57 i dare you so i sent my manuscript and said read to page 57 i dare you i don't know if anyone's out there trying to write a book and if anyone's out there trying to get literary representation but you'll understand the the gasp aspect of that was my second email I sent to obtain literary representation. And he responded in like eight hours from his wife's iPod, iPad in London at four in the morning. This is great. Send me the rest. So I sent him the rest of the manuscript. And it's like, oh, my God the company that represented Neil Donald Walsh wants to represent me. The universe is conspiring on my behalf. I can leave pharma. I can go talk about this stuff, share my experiences, be this, this uh, spiritual paramedic, uh, any place where someone can listen to my voice. And that's where the universe said, ah, ah, ah. so the paradigm changed from the nineties to now. And I was told I need to come up with 5,000 to 8,000 followers on my own before they will then bring me into the fold and start doing what they normally do. My knee jerk reflex was, I'm not Jesus Christ. I'm not out for followers. I just want to tell my story and have fun with it. Um, but yeah, that's not the way the world works. And so the process is now I'm asking people that if you find what I'm saying intriguing, amusing, interesting, um go to my youtube page and follow me and then from there as those numbers grow i can then start reaching out to them and say look at the numbers they're growing pay attention to me i've only been doing this for six and a half years um and in six years i've managed to get like 300 followers um and again i went through the 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 imposter uh thought process of who am i to ask people to listen to what I have to say. I'm just one more um, person on the internet with internet access. Why listen to me? But as I've, as I've talked to therapists, I actually was talking to a therapist and as she's writing her notes, she says to herself, oh my God, this is going to make such a great story. I'm like, I'm here for a therapeutic process and you're thinking about writing a novel. So I didn't go back to that person. Um, and then I was uh, talking to a unity minister and um, She's like, what's your story? And I'm like, you don't want to know my story. And she's like, yeah, I do want to know your story. And I'm like, no, it'll scare you. It'll blow your mind. Trust me. I've done this before. Uh, you know, you, you'll, 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 need, uh, you'll need to be uh, uh, well padded and, and insulated in bubble wrap. And so now she's like, you're going to tell me your story. 
so I laid it out. I spent two hours just kind of laying it out. And at the end, she just like sat there dumbfounded. She's like, I have never met anybody like it. She's in her 60s. She's like, I've never met anybody like you. You've got to tell this story. All right. Well, I'm going to try again. So go to the YouTube page. Follow me there. That'll get the numbers up. And then we'll see if the universe has that plan in store for me or something else. And you've got my, my website and email and books and that kind of stuff down in the links as well. Yes. I don't realize okay. I was muted. Um, so um, yeah, Michelle, you have to get out of here. You got a client. You're a busy lady. We love you so much. I will talk to all y'all later. <laughs> I'll talk to you today. I love you. I love you guys. Thanks. Bye, Michelle. Bye. So, well, yeah, here's the deal. I mean, Jeff Mara. I have grabbed so many people off Jeff Mara. Linda has been on Jeff Mara. Linda has a good rapport with Jeff Mara. We're going to connect you with Jeff Mara. Um, okay. And and also, we already got followers. We have at least a couple new followers. Elizabeth and Laura have said that they will absolutely follow. So I went from um, four to 54 in a month. <laughs> that was amazing <laughs> to me. Well, it's just going to exponentially go from there, John. Um, I, I think we've you've we've discovered your platform. So, um, all right, everybody. On that note, we do want to get uh, Mr. John back February fifth. If that works, we'll find out. We'll we'll let you know. Um, and then Miss Linda, I was going to toss the. Oh, well, also, yeah, I'm going to toss the baton to you. Then you'll toss it back to me. That's how we do. So, would you like to uh, start the thank you process, <laughs> the gratitude process? Yeah, here we go. We're going to. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining in the chat. Um, I love you guys so much. I've missed you. And I so appreciate you being part of what makes this show so special. And I want to thank everyone who attended Angela. You always bring so much wisdom to our whole show. Michelle, she does too. John. Uh, I I already want to book some time with you. And, Same. Same. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I just, I can't wait till you're back on February 5th. And I look forward to all of our growth in our uh, Facebook group. So if you are not in our Facebook group, please, everybody, join our Facebook group because we continue the discussions there. And um, like, share, subscribe, share this. If you think there's someone that can hear this and get something out of it, please share it. Um, it will help John, it will help us, it will help them more than anything. So be sure to do that. And we love you and Kat, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Thank you, lady. I, I love you so much, Linda. Um, so um, yeah, we are, going to, uh, we have the podcast links below as well. So, so if we can get more podcast stuff going for us, that will help everybody that comes on the show, BT dubs. So feel free to have those links. If you hit up those links and share them, if you do podcast. Um, and then finally, I'm going to say, guess who's on next week. It's Rev Ned for those of you and Rev Ned's been in the, the stream today. So I know he's here. We love you so much. Um, so if you are in our Facebook group, in our Facebook group, group, you will know that he is a reoccurring character that we have just fallen in love with more and more. And so this is going to be a different side of Rev Ned. This is going to be him talking about what he's been seeing and getting and um, getting downloads on, on the galactic scale, what's happening on the planet and what's happening with our ET kin and what's happening with the evolution of our ascension. So it's going to be a different focus point that before he was like, I don't know if people are ready for this. And I'm like, come on the show. Let's talk about it. People are ready. They want it. So he'll be with us next week. It's going to be a super, it's just going to be a blast. Um, and so then beyond that, all I got to say is that we love you and we care about you and please be part of our community so that we can um, get to know you better and co-create together and um, let the healing continue to flow and stream from ourselves and out to the world. So with that, um, goodbye, everybody. We love you, and we'll see you next time.